Um, so you got a chow mix, and I saw that you know, labeled as human aggressive. Yes. Okay. So go ahead and break that down for me. Okay. So it's gonna be two in July, and um, like we got him in August of this year. Like we live right across the street, so like I would walk him around. He was fine, and then out of nowhere, he just started like if he saw a dog or a person, he'd like try to jump at them and like bite them. Okay. And like, even when, if we have people over and he doesn't know who they are, mm. he tries, like, he'll be growling at them and bark, barking and mm. trying to bite them. Um, like, my mom, his his family, it's easier now because they, he knows them, but, like, anyone that he doesn't know, he'll just, like, try to attack them. Okay. Has he ever uh, made contact? Um, yeah. Good, yeah. Our, our, the tenant upstairs. Okay. He was like walking out with the suitcase, and he just well, he ripped his leash and he bit his arm. Yeah, bit his arm. Okay, full contact. That's just like, um, like did he puncture or was it just like you know, kind of made contact with the skin and that was it? Not he punctured. Yeah. He had to get stitches. Okay. Uh, how big is your dog? Medium size. Yeah. Seventy pounds, fifty pounds. Yeah, like 50, pounds. fifty pounds. Okay. Sort of like, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> so you're outside with him on the leash, or was he tethered to no, something? No, on the leash. Okay, and then your tenant's coming down the stairs, and then he breaks the leash. Yeah. What, what was it the clip or something? No, uh, it was like uh, sort of like that. Uh huh. Just ripped it. Like the string, string or yeah. Oh, okay. Like pulled away and it just snapped. Just popped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, popped. Okay. Um. What else? Um. And then obviously, like he. He's he just like if he hears a sound or something. He's always barking. Like if he hears steps upstairs, he yeah. just barks for like five minutes straight. Okay. Now uh, what else? Um. And he wasn't like this before. I had him since he was a puppy. You know. And Two months. Yeah. Okay. And um. Like he I used to take him out outside, and he would be on his own, and he would just come back to me, just following me everywhere. And then I said this because we got married in August this year. We came into this house and uh, he was fine for like two weeks. And then my wife just walked along and he just like, started, started crawling. crawling. <laughs> huh. Barking. How old is he now? How old is he now? Two years. He's two years? Yeah. Okay, He's so. two in July. So I think. Okay, so you've had him since two months. Everything was fine. Uh, and then you move and all of a sudden just shift. Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit, that sucks, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then on top of like, him being aggressive, he's in the house, like, he doesn't listen. I mean, he yeah. listens to him, but to me, he doesn't, like, I'll tell him no repeatedly, okay. and he just does whatever he wants. Where'd you guys move from? Suburb, or oh, have you been in the city? Yeah, we've been in the city, yeah. Okay. We were, like, 10 minutes away. Okay. So now we moved here. Maybe he doesn't look Logan Square. <laughs> or were you guys no, moving yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> Okay, well. You guys have a problem. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> so... Uh, I, I just feel like, because he was in, uh, we used to live in a three flat before, and then there was no dogs but him. Mm -hmm. But over here, since there's two dogs... I Within the same building. Yeah, yeah. I think that's his, uh, his problem. He's, I think he's a little bit jealous. <laughs> and when you, when you would walk him at the previous place, like on the street, no reactivity? No, no, no. I used to walk him without a leash, and he wouldn't go anywhere. He seen people... Dogs. No, he wanted to play with them. Yeah, he but just he, wants to play with them. He wasn't aggressive towards them. Would he play with them? Yeah, he would. Okay. He wouldn't like bark at them or anything like that. Um. How long ago did you move here? So we've been here since August. So about three months. Yeah. Okay, three, four months. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three months. Yeah. Okay, three, four months. Um. So he's made contact once already, mm -hmm. but you've seen other attempts. Yes. And then the defensive behavior of people coming into the home, that you had not, again, seen that either until the move here. Right. Yeah. Maybe shit's haunted. I don't know, man. <laughs> 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 I'm like, I'm probably going to issue this. So I have an I'm just joking. I have answers to this stuff. <laughs> um, anything else? Uh, no. Well, I was like, maybe I should bring, uh, bring him out so that way you can uh, play around with the other dog. Mm. I think the other dog is like a. Okay. Yeah, so I'm like, maybe, maybe I should bring him out so that way maybe you can feel comfortable with him. Mm -hmm. But no, like he bit his ear, so I was like, oh, never mind. Mm. So I was like, damn. Uh, did he puncture that as well? Yeah, I did. Okay. No. no, not really, no. 
what, uh, when he came up, was did he like charge in, or were they was he like kind of stiff, and then all of a sudden he, he triggered? Kind of, he was kind of stiff a little bit. He was just trying, I guess, reading him. Uh -huh. He went at him. Was this in the yard or outside? In the yard. In the yard. Yeah. Is this your name? One of your neighbor's dogs? My tenant. Your tenant. Okay. Um, so then, so I was it the same guy that he bit till? Yeah. Oh shit. <laughs> so his son, so it's, he, he, bit, he bit his son. So. Oh, I see. So okay. So it's the dad, the son, and then the dog. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> it's like a family of four, right? Yeah, it's a family of four, and they have a chihuahua. He's scared of the chihuahua, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our dog is scared of the chihuahua. Okay. But he's like, well, chihuahuas don't play, man. They're serious. Yeah. So. Uh, but he lunched at the. Pool. We can't take them out if they're outside. Okay. So, All right. Uh, do you have any idea, lies? As to what could be happening. Yeah, like why that shift? Um, it could be, uh, he could be trying to like claim the space, like new <laughs> territorial, in a new environment. Mm -hmm. Um, it could be also because of like a lot of stress, so it's making him want to be more defensive. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's all I'm thinking right now. Okay, that's pretty good. So a few things here. Um, so. Like I had a client that used to, uh, that came from like a suburb in Michigan, moved to like few Chicago, and then her dog uh, became human and dog reactive. So on the leash dog, like same stuff that you're seeing, right? But uh, it made more sense there because her dog had, was born and grew up in this quiet environment and then moved to Lakeview, Chicago. Mm -hmm. So then it's just like, for us, we're used to the traffic and everything. The dog, they're very sensitive to those changes in energy, you know, the traffic, the honking, the people, the congestion, you know, the noise, construction, like all that stuff is just stimuli for the dog. Mm -hmm. So put the dog under stress. And then, uh, plus the dog was inherently uh, already a nervous dog. So all those things kind of combined just created this problem, okay? Um, so that's why I was asking, did you come from, where did you come from prior, whatever. So um, I'm gonna uh, say it's, it's uh, an agree with the lies that the move uh, put the dog under stress. Okay, now uh, another thing is that there's two pivotal points in the dog's life, technically three, okay? Uh, so we have six months, a year, and then two years, okay? So a lot of times, when a, uh, like a dog will be a friendly, go happy, go lucky puppy, and then they get in a fight at like six months, or they get in a fight at a year, and it, it's like traumatic, and like not, like uh, like a flip of the switch, the next day all of a sudden they're dog aggressive, okay? And the owner like I always ask questions like that, I'm like did anything ever happen when they were a puppy? And they're like, oh yeah, when they're around like you know six and a half months, they got attacked by a dog. I go, there you go, mm -hmm. and then they think, oh wow, like yeah, actually now that I think about it, the next day the dog was had a problem with dog. In your case. If he's a year and a half and we go back about three to four months, that's around the one year mark. Okay. The other thing is uh, at this, at the year mark, dogs are going into, so at six months, um, it's um, teenager body, terrible twos brain is how I like to describe it to people. So it's that if people have kids, like they understand terrible twos, right? Mm -hmm. At a year, we have teenager brain, adult body. Okay, so that's why it's six months to a year, a lot of dogs are like tall and lanky, uh, kind of humans when they're teenagers, and then all of a sudden they fill out at a year. And then at two years, you have adult dog, okay? So at a year is when, is when uh, we can also see something happen, right? Either on its own, unprovoked, or uh, in response to something, okay? So then at a year, your dog's hitting teenager brain, right? And then shortly thereafter, you move. So now we have teenager brain, and then you have a big change, right? And go to this new environment. And then as, as you're saying is, now that he's in this new environment, um, kind of establishing himself, okay? So imagine like, did you guys ever switch schools or go to different schools as you're growing up? It's awkward yeah. the first couple of weeks because like you may not know anybody, right? So you're trying to like find your way uh, in the school and eventually you make your friends and everything and then you're normal, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing for your dog. Usually take dogs, usually takes dogs two weeks to a month. Okay, for them to settle in. So like a lot of clients will pick up a dog from a rescue. They'll bring them home. And then the dog's a great dog the first two weeks to a month. And all of a sudden, flip. And then the dog's reactive or whatever. Or the dog's now attacking people coming into the home. Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, because now your dog has established themselves and they understand where their hierarchy, what the hierarchy is within the home. And then now they're being defensive or territorial in response to that. Okay. Um, in other cases, it's from the get-go. 
right? They bring the dog home and right away it's a problem. And I go, this dog was over, this is nothing that the human did wrong, this dog, like from the get-go, already had that issue. Um, Cause they'll say like, what well, the rescue, they were fine. At the you know shelter, they were fine. I'm like, yeah, because that's not a home setting, yeah. right? There's other dogs, there's a lot of crap going on. So they kind of just like uh, keep their cool cause they don't want to, you know, trigger anything. And then once they go into a home environment where it's like, okay, now it's me and a human and that's it. Now they start to establish themselves. Okay, so I agree with Elias there. So I think it may be the one-year mark. You know, around that time, going into teenager brain, uh, big change, move. Now because he's becoming a teenager, kind of establishing him within the environment, um, and and that's why you're getting the behaviors that you're getting now. Okay, so whether or not if the move had happened or whatever, if the dog would have changed, there's no point in kind of, you know, thinking on that, because uh, a lot of humans will do that. You know, like, oh shit, like, you know, they, they, they'll guilt themselves, like, oh, I wish I never moved because then my dog would have been fine. I'm like, who knows, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, but that would be the other thing that, that uh, the, the other factor is just that psychological shift that also plays a part in all that stuff, okay? So, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, the easiest thing to address is always the reactivity stuff, the lunging on the leash and all that, okay? Uh, the harder stuff is we can't make him like other dogs or people again, okay? Um, that's a decision, we can help him make that decision, but that's a decision that he ultimately has to make, right? So it's like for you, if you don't like something, you don't like it. Only person that can change that is you, right? Uh, so unless you're willing to like, like for me, 10 years ago, or probably longer, uh, I didn't like sushi. That was gross. And my friend was like, try the Godzilla roll. I was like, all right, try the Godzilla roll. I don't love sushi. Right? But I had, you know, I decided all that stuff. I was like, okay, he's like, try this out. I tried it out. I loved it. And then from there, now I eat raw sushi and nigiri and all that stuff. But I decided that, okay? Yeah. Same thing for your dog. We have things that we could do to try to get him back, but we can't make it happen, okay? What we can do is address reactivity stuff. So if you're walking by someone or if you're, you know, you don't have to worry about, oh, is, you know, the tenant upstairs or whatever, that you can just be able to walk your dog and not expect there to be a problem. Okay, because that's simpler. That's simply don't lunge at someone while we're on the leash. Don't lunge at that dog while we're on the leash, right? But then the whole like, okay, well don't lunge at this dog, but also try to make friends with them is more complicated. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, before um, booking this, did you re research on uh, how we trained and how we approach things? Not really. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> so I'll, I'll fill you in. Um, <laughs> um, we train using prong and e-collar. Okay, are you guys familiar with those tools are? Uh, so prong collar is, is, you've probably seen it, it's that spiky looking collar that some dogs wear, right? Mm -hmm. It looks like a medieval torture device, uh, which is not, it's, it's perfectly safe to use. Uh, it's designed to mimic a dog bite. Okay, that's why the way it looks, the way it looks, it's meant to mimic teeth, okay? It's a very effective tool. Uh, we really don't use it a whole lot. It's more so we incorporate it. It's so like right now I have a very intense reactive case and um, they would try to go without the prong collar but the dog was just too difficult. So then we put in the prong collar and it gave them a lot more leverage to stop their dog's reactivity, okay? Um, otherwise the dog will drag them across the street. Uh, we primarily train using e-collar, okay? Which a lot of people refer to as a shock collar, okay? So it's not a shock, it's not electricity running through your dog's body, or it's not electrocution. It's, um, it's a, a miniaturized TENS unit, okay? Are you guys familiar with what a TENS unit is? Have you ever been to a chiropractor or physical therapist? I've been a chiropractor. Have you, have, did they ever put that machine that moves your muscles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a TENS unit. Okay, so that's an e-collar. So they use the technology on humans. Uh, so it's just a muscle stimulator. So you can go to Walgreens or probably even that CVS over there. And if you go in the back section, you'll see uh, it's T-E-N-S, TENS units, right? And they're usually for the back and they'll look kind of like a bone and you put it on your back and you turn it on and it moves your back muscles to relax it, okay? It's the same technology. Um, the reason why it's called shock comes from a couple of places. Um, originally, when e-collars were first designed, they were not very good. They had like three to five levels uh, and they had very big jumps of intensity, okay? Um, the other uh, point where it can come from is in the positive only front in dog training, uh, which is clicker-based, food-based, praise-based, affection-based training. It's all positive, there's no rule aversive. Uh, they wanna use words like shock, torture, pain, all that stuff to deter people from using these tools, okay? Uh, so that's where the term shock comes from, because it kind of just makes you think like you're shocking your dog, right? 
So that's why when we, when we refer to it, we usually refer to it as them, Nick, or tapping the dog, um, because that's essentially what you're doing, okay? And the way we approach the training is similar to the way they approach um, applying the uh, tangent into a human, is when they put the machine on a human, they start low and then they work their way up, okay? And eventually the human goes, hey, that's too much. And then they dip it down and they go, how does that feel? And the human goes, I can deal with that for a bit because you have to be able to tolerate the machine moving your muscle for a period of time. So they don't want you in, in great discomfort, right? Uh, and at some point, uh, you know, humans build their tolerance and then they might increase that, um, that contraction pressure to help ease any kind of muscle uh, pain, tension. Uh, I had a client use it to break up scar tissue on her muscles. Um, they even have deep tissue stem where it's like, a needle that they poke through and then it makes contact to deeper muscles and it can move a muscle even deeper within the body, okay? So they use it all the time on people. So uh, when it comes to e-collar, um, in my opinion, it's more refined than the human version because the human version, there's still risk of electric, uh, electrocution. Um, uh, there is, if you have a pacemaker or anything like that, they can't use it because of the current, they'll interfere. And there's also risk of electrical burn if they don't set it up correctly, okay? We don't have that e-collars. Our e-collars are fully waterproof, both the transmitter and the receiver, so the remote that we use, as well as the collar that's on the dog. Um, it's not, uh, there's no risk of electrocution, it's a fully waterproof system, both the transmitter and the receiver, and there's no risk of electrical burn, okay? Uh, what can happen is if you leave the collar on, because there's two probes like this that make contact with the neck to, um, uh, so this, it can deliver the stem, is if we forget to move it, uh, the dog can develop what's called pressure sores. Okay, so it's not from the stem, it's from something resting against the neck for a long period of time. So it's kind of like um, with people, if they're under, uh, if they're bedridden, they have to rotate them every so often, otherwise they get pressure sores. It's the same concept, okay? Uh, so as long as we're, uh, if we have a dog that's worried extensively, as long as we rotate it every hour and a half to two hours, we can prevent the pressure sores from happening, okay? Um, does that all make sense? Yeah. Question about any of that stuff? So the reason why uh, we use remote collar is because um, it's right off the bat you get off leash control. Um, so like if we're doing um, any kind of recall stuff, if the dog decides they want to dip and run off, we have a means of returning them because we have communication. Uh, in my opinion, it's the only tool that can do that, okay? Uh, common sense based, like it's the only tool that can do that, but some people argue, okay? Because if we use food, right? And I'm like, hey, and I'm waving the chicken, and the dog goes, going after this person is more rewarding or more important. They're going to ignore what's in their hand, right? If we do a prong collar, right, that spiky looking one, it's a great tool. But as soon as you remove that leash, you no longer have a means of communication uh, and any other tool in between, okay? Remote collar, leash or no leash, I have a means of making contact with that dog. Um, second thing is dogs are physical animals. Okay, and your dog is giving you a very good example of that, right? So when he doesn't like something, what does he do? And? Bites. And bites, <laughs> right? So he's giving vocal, verbal warning, and then he's, he's biting as a means of reinforcing that, right? So he might growl and say like, hey, if you come into my home, I'm gonna bite you, right? And if you come into the home, boom, right? Told you I was gonna bite you, right? Mm -hmm. Now physically reinforcing that. So it's like with humans, if someone's talking a lot of crap, and then the person talking crap to confronts them, and then they escalate and then trigger a fight. Well, now we know that person will back up what they're saying, right? We reinforce through physicality. But if that person backs off, now we learn that part of principle is bluffing, right? Same thing for dogs. Dogs bluff and some dogs don't bluff, okay? So it does not sound to me like he's bluffing, right? So, uh, and we know how far he's willing to go because that's why I asked that he make full contact with the, uh, with the tenant. Uh, because some dogs will run up and kind of jump and like make contact but not break any skin or if they do they like yeah. they break or whatever um but that was intentional okay because people go like oh like you know i moved out the way too fast or, or too quick and i'm like nope that dog was letting you know push this even further yeah. i'll really get you next time right so that, that's a dog that would give a warning bite first or an, in, an inhibition bite uh not this guy right because when he was given the opportunity he went on for it and there is one other variable there and that variable was because he was on a leash, it creates frustration, okay? Because he's going, I'm gonna go after this person. And you're of course pulling them back to prevent that. Uh, so by doing so, you now escalate his frustration. 
So it's kind of like with a human, right? Like let's say something's happening and you want to help and someone holds you back. You're going to get frustrated because you're wanting to get to that, to help, right? Same thing for your dog. In this case, he is wanting to go into defense mode, get that person to leave. You held them back, created more frustration, but unfortunately your leash popped. So then it was go. And because you had already escalated him, he just took off at that mindset and just followed through. Okay. So that is a variable there. Um, so in protection training, uh, what we do is we put the dog in a harness. We have a person that agitates the dog and then we pull back on the dog. Okay. So the person's acting suspicious, trying to draw, uh, uh, aggression from that dog agitation. The dog starts to jump and bark and lunge. And then, uh, we want to reward that by letting go of that pressure. Okay. That leash pressure. So the dog can go to attack. Okay. We build on that. So a lot of clients, uh, when they have puppies, especially power breeds like pitties, bull terriers, rotties, German shepherds, they usually walk their puppies in harnesses because they don't want anything choking the puppy. Right? So now they're walking the puppy and the puppy sees a dog and they pull their puppy back because they don't want the puppy to annoy the dog. But the way they interpret it is I saw this other dog. I wanted to say hi. I got pulled back, which is negative tension. And then we'll repeat that over the course of that dog's life. Okay. So as a puppy to go from friendly, happy, go lucky to frustrated because they can't ever greet the dog they want to greet or whatever to, uh, agitated to a potentially aggression. Okay. And obviously now the dog is trying to attack other dogs because the owner unknowingly made their dog a protection dog towards other dogs over the course of time. Does that make sense? So it's what's called opposition reflex. It's when a dog feels tension, they want to go against it. So if you pull back, they pull more forward and that escalates them. And then should we let that go when they're in an escalated state, you're technically rewarding that behavior. And now we would build on that. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, questions on any of that stuff. No. So because he's a physical animal, uh, that's why e-collar and phone collar in my book are so, um, uh, are very valuable tools. Okay. Cause like the prong collar is meant to mimic a dog bite or yeah, dog bite. Mm -hmm. So if the dog became reactive and I popped them on that prong collar, creating this kind of biting motion, I'm telling that dog, don't do that. Cause that's what another dog would do. Mm -hmm. If react, if one dog disagreed with another dog's reactivity, they would bite them to tell them, don't do that. Right. Whether or not this dog listens is a different story. But if a dog's intensity is up here, you're not going to do anything. Okay. And I get this happen. This happens a lot with some of our clients where they have the dog on a prong collar. They try to correct the dog and the dog just keeps becoming reactive. And they're like, I don't understand that it's not working. I'm like, because your dog's intensity is here and our intensity of the correction is down here. And no matter how hard they may be able to correct, if we can never match this, we're not going to get anywhere. Okay. So that's why we need e-collar because e-collar 90% of the time, 99% of the time allows us to match the dog. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a breaking point. It's whether or not we're willing to go there. Okay. So the e-collar, because it's a muscle contractor, it's physical and it's uncomfortable. Okay. So there's um, a couple ways of approaching this, but simply let's say he became reactive and started lunging and barking and we had the e-collar at a level that your dog respected and we kicked in with it and it caused the muscle contraction. We should see him stop the behavior and then pull back. Okay. Then over time, I would want to see him not even gamble the reactivity. He's like, nope, I know if I become reactive, I'm going to get hit at like 80 or whatever. So I know I'm going to just keep myself in check. But then what he learns is he sees the tenant walking by, he didn't become reactive. So there's no negative reinforcer coming from the tenant teaching him that he needs to be reactive. And then he also learns that he can avoid the correction. So he goes, oh, okay. So if I just keep chill, I don't lunge at the guy, um, I don't get corrected and the guy doesn't hurt me. Mm -hmm. That's how the dog learns that there's no need to perceive threat there. Okay. Um, so going back to with the e-collars, I said they originally, they had like levels, like three to five levels. The ones we use now have 127. Okay. So five and 127 are the same. We just have 122 more divisions because so we can really fine tune it to the dog. So before, like, let's say four, your dog was yelping and that, you know, and now three, your dog's not listening. Well, now you're stuck. So it's either your dog's not listening at three or your dog's yelping at four okay. with ours. We can be 30, 40. Uh, 35, 36, 34, we can really fine tune it to the dog and to the moment. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Questions on any of that? So, um, in your case, the first thing that we would cover is always leash walking first. Okay. Which is, we call it the heel. Okay. Uh, what do you walk your dog on currently 
harness, uh, a regular collar? Collar. Regular collar. Okay. We have a harness, but it's just easier to do collars. Yeah, you wouldn't want to use a harness because again, it would make behavior worse. Yeah. It gets gives you less leverage. People like it because a lot of times they have the handle on the back and they just hold the dog mm -hmm. like that, you know. But our center of gravity is here, and because your dog's center of gravity is lower, when they pull and you go down like that, like they have a lot more power over you, especially with that harness, because mm -hmm. you can push forward with the hind legs, pull forward as front legs and just dig his chest into that harness. Mm -hmm. So harnesses uh, are good for pulling sleds. Uh, they're good for pulling tires if you do that with your dog. Um, but in terms of walking, they have no value in my opinion, okay? Um, but even with your flat collar, because if it comes down here, same concept, right? He just pushes into it, yeah. but now it's down here and sometimes it, <clears throat> you'll get that kind of choking sound. Um, is when we teach leash walking, um, it works to help address the reactivity a couple of ways. One, it helps us to put in discipline, okay? So obedience and behavior are two different things. Think of obedience as education and think of behavior as morality, okay? So obedience is stay calm. Uh, 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 education is math, English, science, right? Behavior is don't jump, don't bark, don't bite. Uh, morality is don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, right? So. Uh, a human can be a genius at math, but still be a bad person. And then we can have someone who's a very good person, but maybe not the smartest person, right? They don't overlap. Mm -hmm. Being good at math doesn't make you a good person. Same thing for dogs. Uh, just because they have obedience, just because your dog knows sit doesn't mean they're a good dog, right? It doesn't mean that they're not gonna bite people. They just know how to sit. It's a, tech, it's a skill, yeah. okay? So the reason why we do heal first, it's not because we're expecting the obedience to help your dog. We're expecting the discipline to help your dog the e-collar, the contraction, the, the, the essentially like kind of spanking your dog through the collar is what's going to help them, okay? Because until a dog has felt proper discipline, like the world's their oyster, right? Because I'm assuming your dog uh, has not had any real kind of formal correction. Like you may say no or anything like that, but he's never been like physically corrected. Is that a, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So because of that, it's made your dog kind of uh, uh, machismo, yeah. you know, um, is how I would describe it. Like he just thinks like he's this tough shit, right? But the moment you start to put discipline in the brain, all of a sudden we may see a shift because now you're talking his language and now you're biting him. So now he's like, oh crap, like you mean you can actually do that to me too, right? And then we see how does it impact the dog, okay? So that's why I was like, the reactivity is always the easiest stuff, okay? Because it simply don't do that. I don't care what you do, just don't lunge at the neighbor, don't lunge at that dog, blah, 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 right? Um, so we teach the heel because um, most people in the city of Chicago walk their dogs at least three times a day, uh, seven days a week, right? So that, this allows you to practice discipline three times a day, seven days a week, okay? So now it teaches your dog how the e-collar works on a regular basis. Because people tend to think of these tools as, oh, my dog's being an asshole now. Now I'm gonna put it on him, right? And I go, no. We put on every time we have the opportunity to, and we employ that discipline because that's what changes his mindset. So like for us as humans, our laws are ever present. They don't like all of a sudden disappear and then say, oh, now you're acting bad. Well, now we're gonna bring that law back, right? It's just the red lights are stopped, yellow lights are slow down, you know, green is go. If you run it, you get a ticket, right? That's just how it is to keep society in check. It's the same thing for the dog, okay? So when you're regularly applying the collar, it's, it's like you keeping those laws in effect. So he's like, okay, like there's consequence and I have to be mindful of what my behavior is, okay? And then we see, how does that impact his behavior? So the first class is always heal. Uh, we don't need to touch the dog. We just coach you through it. Uh, we're pr I'm present with you. You're doing everything yourself, okay? So it's all hands-on for you. So e-collar is very effective. It's very efficient. It's very just common sense based. And I've developed it to a point where I don't even need to touch the dog. So before I would train the dog in front of you, then I'd hand you the dog and then you do the training, right? In your case, I wouldn't even be able to touch the dog, right? You'd have to be muzzled first. Here it doesn't matter because we're taking me out the picture, right? So I'm present with you, I coach you through everything, I give you your homework and I say, go off and repeat that, right? Then you come back class two and then you give me feedback. Hey Jesse, like, you know, 80% of his reactivity is gone, 60% of his reactivity is gone or whatever, like, oh, he was like 180. I had one dog that would lunge at humans and, and, and dogs um, very reactive case. We did one class, no reactivity since the one class. 
okay? We get cases like that. I have a case right now where we just had like the fourth or fifth class and that dog is off its rocker, okay? And we're still working on the reactivity. So there's no guarantee of how it's gonna work, uh, but it, it can happen either one of those ways. Typically when we have a difficult case with reactivity, it's almost always some kind of bully breed, okay? It's a pity, it's a rotty, it's a, it's a, it's a bull terrier, it's a bulldog, it's one of those bully types. Most other cases we can resolve fairly quickly, okay? So first week, heal, do your homework, um, come back, pay Jesse, night and day. The only time he was reactive is when, you know, we had to walk by someone and they were really close to us. I go, that makes sense because of the proximity. So we're gonna, we're gonna change a couple of things, we're gonna work on the second half of the heel, uh, tweak a few things, go off and do your homework, right? You come back, did we fix the problem? Yeah, you walk right past someone, you didn't do a thing. I go, great, looks like what we're doing here is fixing this problem. If the answer is no, or the answer is we've had still a couple of instances of reactivity, go, no problem, we're now gonna address it this way, okay? So we're kind of building on everything that you experience, okay? So failing isn't a bad thing, failing is good because that's how you learn to use the tools and that's how you learn how to recover from things. Because your dog could be great for two years and then one day something happens, right? And all of a sudden he's being reactive and then the, the owners are go, oh my God, my dog, like they're, they're, they, they're back, you know, they're being bad again. Oh no, like you just discipline them again. No matter, it's the same answer, it's just it happened two years later. I mean, that's pretty damn good mm -hmm. for the dog not to be reactive that long and then something happened, right? But now you have the tools and the know-how of how to stop the behavior, okay? Because it's not train your dog and then he's fixed and then you do nothing and then expect him to like stay fixed. You, it's, it's like with us, rules are ever present, C consequences are ever present, judges, prisons, jails, cops, like they're here, right? They're not just gonna disappear one day, uh, depending where you live. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> question on any of that stuff. Make sense? Yeah. So, the way we go about um, what program we recommend and stuff depends on how much you're trying to get done with your dog, okay? I really just prioritize what I hear from you and what I think you need and then what you're wanting and then you can always do more or whatever, okay? So, you're, you're at minimum at a six class range, okay? And then we have nine and 12 if you want more, okay? So we have three, six, nine and 12 week programs Three would be too short of a program for you. Uh, so a six at minimum, and then if you did longer, we would, just, uh, we would be able to achieve more, okay? With the six classes, the first class would be heal. What does that fix, okay? Uh, you come back for class two, you give me feedback. Uh, we work on the second part of heal. We make any tweaks to anything that we need to tweak. Go off and do your homework. Come back for class three. How's he doing? Hey. Um, Everything's been great, like walking by people, he's not lunging at our tenant, whatever, blah, 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 blah. I go, okay, cool. How is he with people coming inside the home? Oh, he's still kind of growly, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, we need to do an in-home, right, where I show you how to handle uh, people entering the home. Okay, so that would be class three. Uh, by class four, we should have a, a pretty good idea of like where your dog is at. Uh, if you're wanting to try to get him back to sociability, that would be class four. Okay, where we have an exercise on how uh, uh, we can go about socializing them. If that's something that you want to do, you want to start muzzle conditioning your dog if he's not right now. Okay, because muzzle conditioning can take a couple of days or it can take a couple of months. Okay, so if you start that muzzle conditioning process now, and like let's say there's a delay because of holidays with booking and everything like that, and then uh, you know we have our first classes, that's giving you time to muzzle condition him. So by the time we need that muzzle, it's not a last minute thing, okay? Because we get clients that do that. They save it for like the week of, oh, now we need the muzzle, and you think it's gonna be easy, and it's not, it's very difficult, okay? So you wanna start that process now. So even by the time he gets the muzzle, let's say it's been a month and a half or something, and he still doesn't like it, it's okay. You've already done your part. We just have to get him over the fact of not liking it. Because remember, we can't make him like it, but we can make him tolerate it. But if you've done all the, all the, the conditioning stuff and we do that with food, uh, it'll just make our lives a lot easier when we get to that stage, okay? So by class four, if everything goes well and he's not fighting the muzzle, we would press sociability. If he is fighting the muzzle, then we have to do what we call force conditioning, which is when we use the e-collar to stop the dog from trying to remove it. And then you work on that for a little bit. And then you come back for class five once he's able to tolerate the muzzle and then we work on trying to socialize him, okay? And then class six is just kind of the variable. 
like um, like if everything is going great, then we can I can teach him something like stationary control, which is don't move. Um, or if it's like, hey, we've had some great successes with people coming over, but with the muzzle and everything, but we want another one just so that we know we're doing everything correctly. Then we do another one, okay? But that's how, it, how I would plot out six classes, okay? So it's like the bare bones. I hear your case and I go, okay, um, uh, this is how I'd approach it, just targeting all the important stuff because him sitting doesn't matter, right? If he's trying to bite someone. So that's what we're trying to, trying to fix first. If he did a nine to 12 week program, it just gives us more time to push the behavior or teach more control. So like, let's say we can't make him like people. He just doesn't like them. Um, with stationary control, we don't have one in here. We have like what our, our dog beds. And if we tell a dog to go lay down, they'll lay down on their bed for like hours. So if you have a guest come over and you tell him to go to his bed, he's not gonna move for three, four hours, which allows your guests to be there and not be, um, yeah, not being uh, messed around with or bullied by your dog. Okay, so you'd have that level of control. Um, but it does nothing for him uh, socialization wise, right? Because it's kind of like sending a kid to the room. Yeah. You're like, go to your room, and while, while my friends are here, and then when the friends leave, like, okay, now you can come out of your room, right? But that child never learns how to behave with adults around or whatever. Same thing for the dog, right? So you'd have both approaches. You have, okay, don't move, and then you have, we want him to open up the people, okay? Now, when it comes to opening up the people, um, typically, uh, anybody he would see on a regular basis uh, is more feasible. If it's a one-off, our friend is coming from California, come say hi, probably not going to like that person, okay? Because they're not going to see him on a regular basis. If it's like a family member that he happens to not like that he would see on a regular basis, that can change, okay? That's more feasible. Um, but there's nothing to say that it will. Um, so then if you did nine, we have more time to cover more uh, obedience type stuff alongside the behavior. If you did 12, even more time to cover um, uh, behavior and or obedience, okay? Questions on any of that? Um, one of the most common questions we get is when does the e-collar go away? Uh, it does it when you need it in my book, okay? So that means, let's say when people come over, you put the e-collar on and he's a completely different dog. Just put the e-collar on anytime you're going to expect guests. So guests are coming at 6 o'clock, 5.30, he's already got the collar on, okay? Um, and let's say without the collar, he acts like a jerk because he knows that he can get away with it because you no longer have that form of consequence, okay? Do uh, you guys drive? You go on the expressway? Do you have the speed limit? No. No, All right? right? Most people don't. Uh, you see a squad car, what happens? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, because there's threat of consequence, right? You're gonna get that ticket, you're gonna get pulled over. You don't wanna get pulled over. Everybody slows down, and as soon as we pass the cop up, everybody speeds up, right? That's called opportunistic behavior. All animals do it, okay? Including humans. Uh, it's part of survival instinct because hunting, or, or a dog or an animal hunting something requires opportunity. Right? So same thing for your dog. When that collar is off, now he has the opportunity to act like a, a, a jerk and not have consequence, right? Collar is on, it's gonna be that cop on a collar. He's gonna think, okay, collar is here. I know I can be corrected, so I'm not gonna act like a jerk. I'm gonna ignore these people, right? Uh, it's normal. Um, uh, it's just the, the way of the world because people are like, well, if the training's so good, why do I need the collar? And like, because it's an animal, and it's because it's the dog, and because of opportunistic behavior. Like, if the collar is not present, your dog is gonna push things, okay? So if you're walking him, he'd have the collar on. If he's gonna be off leash, you'd have the collar on. If guests are coming over, you'd have the collar on. Anytime you feel like he'd need it, you'd have it on, okay? And if he's a great dog otherwise, you take it off, you don't need it, okay? So it's nothing good or bad, it's just how it is. Um, the other thing is, um, with like, let's say, because uh, my dogs, they've been off these trained for like 10 years and they still wear their collars. I just don't have to press the button really. Uh, it's not that you're, if, if you do the homework correctly, you're not always using it. The use of it goes down. It's just the presence of it keeps your dog in check. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, questions on any of that? No. Um, the barking in the home, when you said he was like, this, uh, was, is that a new thing too? Or has that always been? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a new thing too. Okay. Yeah, he wasn't like it before. That may go away. Maybe, yeah. No, that was, that was, that existed before. Okay. That may go away on its own uh, through the discipline. So uh, that alertness um, is just part of territorial behavior. Uh, can also be a part of overstimulation. 
uh, where the dog uh, has a hard time settling down. So they're constantly kind of in this state and then any little thing yeah. triggers, right? Uh, once we cover heel and all the behavioral stuff, we may start to see that inside like uh, alertness start to go down on its own, okay? Um, your dog will, naturally dogs are uh, alert to some degree as it is, right? So like my dog will bark at a sound, yeah. right? But she's not barking all the time. There's some stuff she hears, she's like, okay, that's just a neighbor, I, need to, I can ignore that. And there's other things where she's like, okay, that's, a, that's a, somebody walking up the stairs that I don't recognize and she'll bark. That's normal, okay? But if it kind of sees, seems excessive, then we should start to see that dip. If it doesn't dip and it's annoying to you and you want to stop it, we have an answer for that too. And we would cover that with you, okay? Um, any other questions? Uh, when it comes to booking and everything, um, keep in mind winter is coming, right? So like, so if you did start uh, training, uh, we can use the inside of my space. I have a 13,000 square foot space uh, uh, in total and that five to 6,000 square foot uh, training space. So there's plenty of space for us to work inside. Um, and uh, in your case, the reactivity stuff outside, I wouldn't worry about. So, because people ask like, well, if we're training inside, are we still gonna get the results outside? And the answer is yes, technically speaking. If your dog is 20 out of 127 within my building, right, because it's indoors, it would make sense that outside your dog's number would be higher because there's gonna be more stimuli. So as long as you're willing to go higher to stop the dog or do whatever for the training, it should just transfer no problem, okay? Uh, but you would still need to reinforce your training even during the snow and the winter and all that stuff, okay? Um, in terms of like people coming over and stuff, do you, would you regularly have people come over or is it kind of on, on, on occasion you have someone come over? I think on occasion. Yeah. Okay. Mostly just like family members, but he's okay with our like parents and siblings. So just like newer people? Yeah. Gotcha. So bear in mind that something like that would take time for him to come get over because it's um, inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So if you have one new guest a month, like it's probably gonna be quite a while before he might warm up to that person, yeah. right? But if you're having a new, uh, new guest two to three times a week, you're gonna have a lot faster progress, okay? So just keep that in mind too, is once you learn the skill and everything, uh, you just use it as you need it. But in terms of trying to progress his behavior, um, it would, if, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna be quite a while, okay? Um, in terms of booking and stuff, Please allow Maria a five to seven business day turnaround because since you booked your consultation, other people have sent in their forms and she's trying to book them. Yeah. Plus we have previous previous clients that are booking their consults or their training follow-ups to their consults from before. Plus there's my current list of clients already, okay? Um, but otherwise, uh, we do a recurring schedule. So like if like a Friday at seven worked for you and that was available, if you did six classes, Friday at seven for six classes plus one would be your time. No one can take it from you, okay? If you end up canceling or rescheduling, for whatever reason, uh, and you do so within appropriate time, you don't lose the classes, but you may lose that time. Okay. So we give you priority. So for six weeks plus one, so seven weeks, you know, 7 p.m. and Friday would be your time, uh, for example. And then let's say you reschedule a few of them. You may have two classes left over, but you've used up your priority. So then evenings and weekends are in high demand for me. So then to keep my calendar rolling, because Maria goes, okay, this person needs seven at p.m. at, you know, Friday you're finishing here, I'm gonna book them right after you would finish, technically speaking, okay? Otherwise, if you have classes left over, you would simply um, um, reschedule them for another time that you'd be available, okay? Uh, in regards to the cost of the collar, um, I would recommend your dog go on the Dog Chub Lock Edition, which is meant for a 70 pound dog and over. Uh, so it's plenty of power for a dog of your size, it's perfectly safe to use. Even if your dog is under, like I could put on my eight pound Chihuahua and it'd be perfectly fine. It's, it's just you get more from less, okay? Because what's different is the output, okay? So on a lower power collar, your dog's number might be higher. On a higher power collar, your number, dog's number should be lower. So it gives you more to work with when your dog becomes agitated. Uh, does your dog have a thicker like ch ch chow chow coat or is it a short coat? No, it's short. It's short? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, one thing you're gonna factor in is the coat. If the fur is acting as a buffer to the contacts, you're not gonna have full contact. You also want to think that when your dog is uh, becoming aggressive, he's in a stimulated, adrenalized, agitated state, is you may need more power to cut through all that mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to get him to settle. So having that collar, it's the best collar, um, one mile range, fully waterproof system. Uh, I'm not 
having to worry about like what happens if we get the dog and it overrides the collar. Now you have to buy a new collar and send the other one back and now you get this whole kind of you know, nonsense going on. Let's just say get the good one off, the, get the best one off the bat and then you'll be perfectly fine, okay? Um, and you can get that collar through us or you can get it through Amazon. I don't care where you get it from. I just care that you get the correct collar. And Maria will send you the information uh, for that, okay? Other questions? Um, other than that, I mean, it's pretty typical, um, especially chow chows. Um, they're kind of known for being territorial. I just did a chow case uh, over the summer named Zoe. It's a black chow. Same thing. Fine with the parents, fine with the, the kids, but it hated everybody else. But then with the training, they were able to have people come over. They just wouldn't pet her, but she would mind her own business. So, okay. Okay. Anything else? No. All right. If you guys want to get an idea of what the training looks like, if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, and you go through my website, just click on the video. Okay. Uh, lesson ones are always great to watch because um, uh, you see everything explained, okay? But it gives you a visual of how it works out. If you're seeing a case that looks kind of like, what the hell is this? It's probably a very intense case, yeah. okay? Because most cases are pretty straightforward. So like the, the pity Mia that I was talking about, like hers are crazy because she's just a crazy dog as it is. Um, if you'd like to see that chow that I was talking about, her name is Zoe, and you'll see her. She's a, a black chow, but she's one that I worked with um, with the e-collar and stuff, and then she didn't like, she was re same thing, reactive, yeah. but then also territorial. And then after the training, they were able to have people come over and everything. She just wouldn't want to socialize with them. Yeah. Okay? okay? Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure, guys. If you have any other questions, you can let Maria know, okay. and then she'll get back to you. Um, otherwise... So we'll get an email from her? You can either email your, her yourself, and then you can send her and let her know like um, you'd like to move forward in your good lives. Oh, thank you. Um, um, you can tell her like, hey, Maria, we want to do six, and uh, you know, here's our schedule, and then because that's what she's going to ask you for anyways. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get ahead of the game a little bit, you can email her and just say, hey, Maria, we want to do six classes or whatever, and here's our availability. So this way, when she comes back to respond to you, she already has that information. And she's not asking you the same thing and then waiting for you to respond. Okay. Um, um, otherwise, she'll email you uh, no more than five business days, seven business days. Okay. okay? And the email does she provide like pricing and stuff? Yes. Okay. All that. It's also on my website, okay. but uh, but she'll go over all that stuff as well with you. Okay. Okay. Anything else? I think that's it. All right. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Do you, you guys do uh, dog care also? I'm sorry. Uh,